Welcome to the program. This is the Black Ponder. I'm Neil Trotter. And, it, you know, it has been a while since I've posted a video. But, you know, other than just life stuff, um, I've also been reading really big books <laughs> that take a while. You know how some philosophy books are. They're chunky and, you know, not only do they have a lot of pages, uh, but, you know, the margins are very thin and the text is very small. So they, it's, it's a lot crammed into it. So it takes a while to read books that I, that I like to read, which is fine. Nothing wrong with that. You know, it's studying philosophy is not a race. It's a marathon, right? And I know a little bit about marathons. <laughs> but in this video, we're going to be talking about Hegel's uh, third volume of his History of Philosophy lectures. Now let me give you a good, uh, you know, screenshot for a thumbnail. Let's see how can we do this. This is nice. Just like that. Let me peek. Yeah, smile for the camera. Okay, cool. We got it. We got it. So, in, in this lecture series, you know, Hegel was a uh, professor of philosophy and he taught <laughs> philosophy as a professor as well as just being a philosopher and developing his own philosophy. And much of his philosophy actually focused a lot on uh, religion. Religion, it's true, it's true. He talked a lot about religion and God. It's interesting how, uh, you know, I'll get comments about how, you know, stay away from topics like politics and stay away from topics like religion. You know, philosophy is devoid of that, right? But that is so incorrect, right? I mean, there's entire fields of philosophy, huge branches of philosophy, disciplines like political philosophy or, and as well as philosophy of religion and some of the greatest philosophers um, that ever lived were very religious and even if they weren't religious they, they talked about religion a lot. <laughs> and Hegel in his third volume of his lectures on the history of philosophy, he talks a lot about religion particularly Christianity. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, understand that Hegel in his uh, lecture series, is, he's not correct in several ways. Like he gets some, or he gets a significant amount of history wrong. <laughs> uh, but I'm reading it more just so I can understand his, his frame of reference, like how he thinks. So I can later read his uh, more complex texts with you know kind of a frame of reference like what, what is this where is he coming from and one of the things that he talks about in his series um, in the third volume in particular is how okay once philosophy started delving into the the realm of christianity that's when philosophy took a turn for the the, the better right that's when the ball really got rolling with philosophy so it's kind of this favoritism towards Christianity. The institution of Christianity embraced philosophy. That's when all of a sudden philosophy really started developing and exploding into, in this amazing way. Before then, philosophy wasn't as good or wasn't as uh, deep or detailed. And you know, that's a very Eurocentric way of looking at things. It's not necessarily correct. And we're not really going to talk so much about that. But we are going to focus on this video about some philosophy of religion. And what I want to talk about is, um, I guess, some misinterpretations of Christianity or some, you know, things that I personally believe are, we've kind of lost our way in Christianity, me being Christian myself. I think there are aspects of Christianity that we really focus on that kind of lead us astray or even um, detract from why Christianity is valuable. It kind of detracts away from the value of Christianity, right? This kind of misinterpretation or this misconstruing of the religion, I would say. That's what I want to talk about. And how do we talk about that? We read quotes. That's what we do here at the Black Ponder. We actually read the philosophical text, and then I provide supplementary commentary, and then we continue the discussion 
in the comments section because philosophy is a conversation, right? You may agree or disagree, but we talk about it in a critical, intelligent, civil manner. So this publication <laughs> is from Routledge and Keegan Paul Limited. <laughs> okay, that's the publication. Maybe you have that. I actually just printed this online for free. I just Google searched it and I think it's from the Gutenberg Press or Gutenberg website where they just have a bunch of old text that you can just print for free. Uh, that's where I got mine. So if you if you have this publication or if you you know downloaded it from that site uh, and you want to follow along, I will give you the page numbers. The first quote is on page four, uh, beginning at the, the end of the sixth line here. It is an actual self, an I, quote unquote, the absolute universal, the concrete universal, that is God, and also the absolute opposite of this determination, the clearly finite as it exists in space and time. But this finite determined in unity with the eternal as self, the absolute comprehended as concrete. The unity of these two absolutely different determinations is the true God. Each of them is abstract, and either of them taken by itself is thus not the true God. The fact that the concrete is thus known to men in this perfection as God brings about the whole revolution that has taken place in the world of history. So again, Hegel, one of the most popular philosophers, or one of the most influential philosophers that has ever lived, right? and he's talking about God left and right, front and center. So it's kind of, it is difficult to have a discussion about philosophy without first having a discussion about religion. And what is he saying in this text, Hegel? Well, what Hegel is talking about here is this relationship between the self, right, and God. Philosophy is about understanding what is the self? Who am I, you know, as a, a being, right? Who is this person, Neil Trotter, this self? And how does that self relate to the divine or God? Is God a self? Is God a being? And what is the relationship between God's self, God's being, and my being or your being? The relationship between self and selves. This is a huge focus of philosophy. Let's continue that we're at the very end of page four, the last sentence. Thus man reaches this truth. And I skip to page five, first sentence. We thus first have man through this process attaining to spirituality. And in the second place, we have man as Christ, in whom this original identity of both natures is known. Now, since man really is this process of being the negation of the immediate and from the negation obtaining to himself to a unity with God, he must consequently renounce his natural will, knowledge, and existence. So let me stop here right quick. Okay, so what Hegel is mentioning is, you know, in Christianity, there's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who became man, right? And Hegel is bringing this up because he's bringing up the, one of the objectives of philosophy, which is, what is the self? What is being? And what he's saying is, look, in Christianity, there, God became man through Jesus Christ. He, this is how God express being as man. And this is how God relates to human beings because God became a human being through sending his son, Jesus Christ, to live on earth. This type of relationship between human being selves and God self, this God becoming man is a relationship of uh, humanity and God, you know, this uh, connection between divinity and humanity. Right? And it is also an expression of being, right? What does it mean to be? What does it mean for God to be? Or how is God's being expressed? We can look at Jesus Christ to understand this. Let me continue. This giving up of his natural existence is witnessed 
in Christ's suffering and death and his resurrection and elevation to the right hand of, of the Father. Christ became a perfect man, endured the lot of all men, death as man he suffered, sacrificed himself, gave up his natural existence and thereby elevated himself above it. In him this process, this conversion of his other being into spirit and, I underline this, the necessity of pain in the renunciation of the natural man is witness. But this pain, the pain of feeling that God himself is dead, is the starting point of holiness and of elevation to God. Mm -hmm. That's end of my underline. Well, I'll continue right here. Thus, what must come to pass in the subject, this process, this conversion of the finite is known as implicitly accomplished in Christ. This constitutes the great leading idea of Christianity. It's true. It's true, right? This idea, right, that uh, for man to be saved, uh, God had to sacrifice his son to save humanity, right? That God had to have his son uh, experiences painful death as a sort of just balance, right, to uh, compensate for our sinful nature. So this is what I want to throw out there, right? And this is not something new that I came up with. Um, several other videos by other authors bring this idea up. Uh, the idea that we focus, our Christians kind of put that front and center, right? Uh, God died, Jesus died, suffered a horribly painful death to save us from our sins, right? Um, and we instead focus on that, Christians, instead of focusing on the teachings of Christ, you know, Christ, Jesus as a Messiah, right? And how he, Jesus uh, had lessons that he told while he was alive on earth as man, and those teachings aren't really acknowledged really all that's really acknowledged is his his death right and then so and then on top of that we put the suffering front and center this torture that he endured right for us we hyper focus on that right and i think that has become problematic right not to say that not to belittle the sacrifice, right? It is indeed it was indeed a sacrifice. But when all focus is put on that, rather than the philosophy of Jesus, right? Or you know, his philosophy that he taught on earth, this prioritizing of the death of Christ rather over his teachings, right? And in, in to the point where we don't as Christians or the Christian institution doesn't even really follow the teachings, right? All they, all the institution is, well, Jesus died for us, we are saved, end of story. Okay? This has caused some negative ramifications. That's what I want to talk about. What I said in my notes and margins here is, this is a bit of an, I would say, archaic interpretation of Christianity where we need to begin to um, evolved this understanding of the life of Jesus Christ and why it was important. <laughs> now, bear with me, bear with me, because I know a lot of Christians are going to get upset. They're like, well, what are you trying to do? Are you belittling his death? And, you know, he suffered tremendously for you. And I understand all that. I, and I acknowledge all that. But I think we've lost some other key aspects of his life story in the process. Uh, just hyper focusing on that one thing that he did for us, which is huge. I'm not saying it's not, but uh, we need to also focus on the other things. So what? Um, so what has happened is we, as a a society, or the the zeitgeist even of pop culture, because you know Christianity has so seeped into popular culture, even. Be, you know, non-religious people, atheists, even, you know, Christianity, the ideology is everywhere and you can see it all over the place. And I would say one of the ways you can see that is through uh, this idea of pain as necessity, right? You have to suffer 
to develop as spirit. Like that is the most important thing is to suffer, right? Uh, to develop spiritually or to reach uh, divinity or like to maybe the interface with God. There needs to be a kind of suffering that takes place. Pain is necessary and to the point where pain is actually good, right? Uh, which is, I think, kind of incorrect. And we kind of, now we, as a society, because of this, we're obsessed with suffering and pain and we've kind of like worshiped violence in the sense. And you can see that in society today, this worshiping of violence in the, in the name of justice. It has to do with the fact that our very, our, the most deeply held stories that we hold have that theme going for them. Like through suffering, agony, violence, and pain, we are saved. Now there's some more to it than that. There's actually a lot more to it than that. And I put it in my notes like, so pain is a consequence, you know, not, not so much a necessity. Yes, yes, the sacrifice had to happen, right? But instead of looking at it as a necessity, which I'm not saying it wasn't, we should look more at, to it as a consequence, right? Like, okay, because Jesus Christ taught us these valuable lessons that we should follow, he was killed for that. <laughs> not because he was killed for that because he taught these lessons, which, you know, both are true, but I think we focus more on the killing and the, the torture part rather than the, the lessons, right? And so we don't focus on the philosophy. But I'm gonna keep it rolling here. I'm gonna keep it rolling. We're now on page, this is the end of page eight. This so-called doctrine of original sin implies that our first parents have sin, that this sin has thus descended to all mankind as an hereditary disorder and has come upon posterity in an external way as something inherent in their nature, which does not pertain to freedom of the mind, nor has its ground therein. Through this original sin, it is further signified, man has drawn upon himself the wrath of God. Okay, let me skip down three lines. What every member of the human race really is in himself is represented here in the form of the first man, Adam. And in this first man, sin manifests itself as something contingent, or more particularly, in his allowing himself to be enticed into eating of the apple. But it is again, not merely represented that he simply partook of the fruit, but that he ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It is as man that he must partake of it, and not as beast. The fundamental characteristic, however, through which he distinguishes himself from the animal is the very fact that he knows what good and evil are. That's key, right? Knowing the difference between good and evil. For God likewise says, Behold, Adam has become as one of us to know good and evil. But it is only through man's having the power of thinking, of thought, that he can make this distinction between good and evil. In thought alone is there thus the source of good and evil. But the healing of the evil which is brought about through thought is also there. The second point is that man is by nature evil and transmits the evil. Okay. On the other hand, it is said, why should the sinner suffer punishment, seeing that there is no responsibility for what is inborn in him? As a matter of fact, the statement that man is implicitly or by nature evil would seem to be a hard saying. But if we set aside this hard saying and do not speak of a divine punishment, okay, put that aside, but make us of mild general expressions, in this idea of original sin, the fact remains for us that underline this, I, I underline this, that man as he is by nature is not what he ought to be before God. Okay. But has the power of becoming explicitly what he only is implicitly. And the fact that this rests in the determination of man as such is represented as inheritance. The abrogation of mere naturalness is known to us simply as education and arises of itself through education. Subjection is brought about and with that a capacity for becoming good is developed. Now if this appears to come to pass very easily, 
we must recollect that it is of infinite importance that the reconciliation of the world with itself, the making good, is brought about through the simple method of education. Okay? We're talking about the difference between good and evil. Man has acquired that, you know, we're still talking about religion through Adam, right? By eating the apple and Eve as well, right? She acquired that knowledge too, that's the, as the saying goes. It's the learning of what is good and evil, morality, ethics. This is what's important, what is important. This is spiritual development. I put in my notes, humans do not know initially who they are. They must learn who they are. That learning happens through free will, okay? That free will is what we inherit. It is our original sin. That's what original sin is, I propose. It's free will. It's our understanding of, oh, there actually is a difference between good and evil. So we can't make that excuse. We can't say, well, I just didn't know. I didn't know that what I did was evil. No, you knew. You knew because you have a brain and you can think. So that, 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 that determined that distinction, that ability to distinct between good and evil, ethics, morality, is free will. That's what I propose. That's what free will is, essentially, is your ability to discern between good and evil. Okay, and there's consequences, you know, and ramifications for that distinction, for your distinguishing between the two. Let me skip down. This is at the end of page 10, okay? It starts with here, man is determined for freedom. He is here recognized as implicitly free. This freedom is, however, at first only formal because it remains within the principle of subjectivity. The Christian religion should be worked out for thought and be taken up into thinking knowledge and realize in this that, and thus that it should attain to reconciliation. Okay? So he goes on to something, right? You say, look, what is really the, 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 main, the value of Christianity? If you partake in Christianity, right, what is your responsibility, right? What, what is, what are you actually doing as a Christian? Like, what, what are you supposed to do, right? What are you accepting to do? You know, what is your responsibility? I would argue like the responsibility is accepting that, okay, free will is a thing, but you know, there's all types of debates about what is free will, do we have it, do we not have it? I would just say like the Christian interpretation is that free will is this ability to distinguish between good and evil, that you ha have no excuse for that, that acceptance of, okay, I can't like make this excuse like I don't understand what I'm doing. No, you, you can't. You just have to learn. You have to educate yourself. That's one of the core aspects, I would say, of Christianity. But well, let's dive more deeply into this idea. I'm here at the toward the end of page 20. Man should not be what he is by nature. He should be spiritual. Okay. So what does that mean? Are we just to reject who we are naturally? Not quite. Rather, we should focus on developing spiritually. What, what does that mean? Well, let me read you this quote. It's at the end of page uh, 21. On the appearance of Christianity, it is, first of all, said, my kingdom is not of this world. That's what Jesus said when he was on trial. Right. Uh, you know, Pontius Pilate is interrogating him, asking him questions, and you know, one of the things Jesus says is, you know, my kingdom is not even of this world. You know, that's a quote from Jesus, rather it's from heaven, right? Beyond the earth, the material world. Uh, but let me continue here. But the realization has and ought to be in the present world, okay? In other words, the laws, customs, constitutions, and all that belongs to the actuality of spiritual consciousness should be rational. The kingdom of rational Actuality is quite a different one and must be organized and developed thinkingly and with understanding. The moment of the self-conscious freedom of the individual must maintain its rights against objective truth and objective command. This then is the true and actual objectivity of mind in the form of an actual 
temporal existence as state. Just as philosophy is the objectivity of thought which comes to us in the form of universality, such objectivity cannot be in the beginning but must come forth after being worked upon by mind and thought. In Christianity, these absolute claims of the intellectual world and of spirit have become the universal consciousness. All right, so let me read you my notes. Right. What is spirituality? It is the application of philosophy to obtain transcendence. Okay, before transcendence can be achieved, one needs self-actualization. So philosophy is a tool that we can use to obtain self-actualization. -actuali so what is self-actualization? Self-actualization is, is, is many things. We've talked about this on several of my videos. Uh, but I think self-actualization is a, a transcending of, of nature. It's like knowing who you are, you know, deeply, deeply who you are spiritually, like knowing your true self, right? And you do that through a philosophical understanding between the relationship of your being with the spiritual. Hegel is saying that spirituality is, is rationality. <laughs> what? What, what, what does that mean? Well, uh, think about it, like, you look at nature and it is quite irrational, right? It is quite irrational. Like, a lot of times you look at nature or the natural world and, you know, just look around you and you're like, well, I don't, this doesn't make any sense. Like, things happen, current affairs take place and you're just dumbfounded. You're like, what is going on? <laughs> like, d d the ability to, s to just stop and think and critically assess what's happening, you know, turning this irrational thing that is nature into like building a logic from that, a structure, a reasonable structure that you can process all this irrational information to make sense <laughs> of who you are, yourself, your relationship with y yourself and nature, reality. Uh, this is a spiritual activity, all right? This is uh, developing our rationality from irrational nature, <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? This is a spiritual process. And what Hegel is saying here is this is what Christianity is about, really, truly. And I would agree, right? I would say like, you know, Christianity is about this. I skipped down five lines. We're still on page 22. Into this element of the nullity of actuality, the whole world has raised itself passing out of this principle, indeed, but also into the kingdom of thought. Because that nothingness has transformed itself into what is positively reconciled. Okay, when Jesus, you know, you can interpret that in a number of different ways. You can say, you know, when Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world, <laughs> right? You can say, like, well, yeah, you know, because he's eventually going to go to heaven as the story goes which you know again i'm a christian i believe but you can also say like his, his kingdom is not of this world he's not following the law of the land right he's following rational his rationality his divine rationality that you know comes from god who he refers to as the father likewise we also have to take a step back and look at the world around us and see like and figure out okay what what's the problem here what there are some problems here there's some irrational things that are going on and you have to sit down and do the 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 thinking the the, the hard work of assessing applying critical thought philosophy into okay there's a lot of irrationality happening i'm gonna use sound philosophy to get through all this to work all this out and to discover myself and to so that I can do good in the world. I even put here in my notes, overcoming nihilism and despair through applied philosophy. <laughs> because I, I would say like nihilism, despair, that's when the irrationality of reality, of nature, just gets too much. You're like, I don't even, what's going on here? I guess all things don't mean anything, I suppose, right? Not exactly. Like, don't give up. Uh, the world can be irrational, but you, we have to do the hard work of applying logic, reason, philosophy to make sense of not the world necessarily, but ourselves.
All right, and then once we understand ourselves, once we self-actualize, then we can do good in the world and build a rationality that we can apply to the world to make it better. But let's return to the idea of suffering as necessary to spiritual development. Okay, I start on page 47. This is the first sentence here. The nature of spirit, on the contrary, requires that the world thus constituted should be begotten from it, and that this process of begetting should take place through the agency of reaction, through the assimilation of something which has gone before. These conquerors have thus established themselves in a foreign sphere and have become the rulers over it, but at the same time they have come under the domain of a new spirit, which has been imposed upon them. Although on the one hand predominant, on the other they have come under the dominion of the spiritual element, because they conducted themselves passively in regard to it. The spiritual idea or spirituality has become imposed upon the dullness, both in mind and spirit, of those rough barbarians, their hearts were thereby pricked, their rough nature has in this way become imminent in the idea as an eternal opposition, or there is kindled in them infinite pain, the most terrible suffering, such that it may even be represented as a crucified Christ. They had to sustain this conflict within themselves and on one side of it found in the philosophy which later on made its appearance amongst them and was first of all received as something given. They are still uncultured people, but for all their barbaric dullness, they are deep in heart and mind on them. Then has the principle of mind has been bestowed and along with it, this pain, this war between spiritual and natural has necessarily been instituted. Instituted. Okay. Culture here begins from the most terrible contradiction and this has to be by it resolved. It is a kingdom of pain, but a purgatory for that which is the pain is spirit and not animal. And spirit does not die, but goes forth from its grave. The two sides of this contradiction are really thus related to one another in such a way that it is the spiritual which has to reign over the barbarians. So what's being said here? What I get from this is that throughout human history, right, we have human, human beings have encountered uh, the reality that life is suffering, right? You suffer tremendously in life a lot of the time, mental, physical, spiritual, emotional, all these various dimensions that one suffers through in life. Why is this happening? What's, what's going on? Right? And to make it rational, you can see this through our most cherished stories, right? Even the, the, one of the most cherished stories of a lot, many human beings believe in, which is the crucified Christ, right? And so, you know, this obsession, this reality that is irrational, why is this happening, has become so dominant in our psyche throughout history that it has become an obsession. Like, we have to make sense out of this. Like, why is it, why do we suffer in this world? And this reality that pain is life, right, has become obsessed over so much that we worshiped it, right? It is like, it's become something that we have created divine. It's so glorious, right, that we, somebody suffers for the, us to be saved, for life to prosper, for spiritual development to happen. It's a kind of warped or escape, escape mechanism or a form of uh, dealing with uh, the cruelty of reality that has led us astray, where it's like all that matters is suffering. All that matters is Christ being crucified. All that matters is violence. Violence is glory, right? Through violence, we achieve everything, right? And I argue like this has led us astray. I put in my notes, from here we come up with this notion that spiritual development is suffering and that suffering needs to be inflicted on others 
via exploitation. Okay, let me continue with this. Uh, I skip down four lines in the text. The dominion that exists must take up this position. That spirit is in subjective spirit in harmony with itself. The universal is thus the opposition in which the one can only have supremacy by the subjection of the other, but which already contains the principle of resolution in itself because mind must necessarily bear rule. And hence, the consequent development is only this, that mind as reconciliation attains the mastery. To this it pertains that not the subjective consciousness, mind and heart alone, but also the worldly law, laws, institutions, the human life, insofar as these rest in mind, must become rational. So I put in my notes, there is a, a specific kind of rationality that is enforced. Okay. This rationality, this spiritual development through subjugation in this guise of spiritual development. You know, I would argue, you know, look at the world, you know, look at things like extreme capitalism, right, where things get, where people are exploited, you know, look at throughout history, you know, colonialism, you know, manifest destiny, this idea like, oh, we have to spread uh, Christianity, right, we have to spread it. And how do we do that? We uh, exploit people who don't follow the religion and we uh, force them to, do, uh, to follow the religion. And if they don't choose to follow it, we will kill them, we will torture them, we will make them suffer until they do because that, that is the way spiritual development happens is through this suffering, this torture, this, this violence, you know, and you can just see that throughout even today, right, with uh, things like the prison system where, you know, correctional facilities, right, we all know and I talk about this in my video, uh, Our Prisons Obsolete by Angela Davis where people com commit crimes, they're sent to prison. Prison, we all know, is a horrible place. It is basically a torture chamber, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, but, you know, our, in our minds, you know, in this society, we have decided, like, well, they've done wrong, and they have to suffer, right? They have to suffer, and in that way, they become be better. They become corrected, <laughs> right? This idea that suffering, uh, exploitation, this is the way to spiritual development. And it, you know, it all leads back up to these divine stories of violence that, that have you know, reached a kind of divine glorification. It's led us astray. And you can see that in our society, like why violence is glorified. But I'll continue with the text. In the Republic of Plato, we have met with the idea that the philosophers are those who ought to reign. Now is the time in which it is said that the significance, spiritual, are to govern. But this talk about the spiritual has been made to bear the significance that ecclesiasticism and the ecclesiastics ought to govern. The spiritual is thus made a particular form, an individual, but the real meaning that it bears is that the spiritual as such ought to be the determining factor. And this has passed current until the present day. Right. The, there is no separation of church and state, really, when you really think about it. Um, look at the most powerful institutions in the world, steeped in religion, right? And, is this, and how does the most powerful institutions carry forth their power? <laughs> Through violence, right? We see this throughout the world. Violence is used to um, enforce power, right? And this and the guys, the story that's told is, oh, you know, we're, we're, the violence is being used to cleanse, right? To make the world better, to make our society better, right? There needs to be this type of exploitative violence to eventually become morally better. This is what I'm getting at. We've obsessed over violence as a means of spiritual development for so long. <laughs> uh, we've lost our way and now, uh, the most powerful institutions in the world, right? The governments and the enterprises that 
uh, have all social economic power. They even use this kind of ideology right, to enforce their power. And they're able to do that because on a, you know, this kind of thinking is so ingrained in our psyche, our collective psyche. It's time to break out of it. I'll skip down to the next paragraph. One form of this reconciliation is likewise this, that the subject is satisfied with himself and in himself as he stands and moves with his thoughts, his desires, with his spirituality, and thus that his knowledge, his thought, his conviction has come to be the highest and has the determination of the divine, of what holds good as absolute. The divine and spiritual is thus implanted in my subjective spirit, is identical with me. I myself am the universal, and it has efficacy for me only as I directly know it. This form of reconciliation is the newest, but the most one-sided. For the spiritual is not there determined as objective, but is only com comprehended as it is in my subjectivity, in my consciousness. My conviction as such is taken as ultimate, and that is the formal reconciliation of the subjective with itself. So, you know, this marriage of the state and this religious ideology, which I would argue is far from the original philosophy of Jesus Christ, right? Uh, but this violence-based, exploitative-based religious ideology has married itself with the power structures of the world, like the prison industrial complex or policing, right, or capitalism. We look at these institutions and we're, we, we see the violence that these institutions cause and we see them, the society as a whole, um, sees them as necessary, like um, a kind of cleansing, like a kind of like development through violence a kind of like crucifixion, right? Just like the crucified Christ, a necessary suffering. And this is where we have lost focus, I would argue, as Christians. We have lost focus on, you know, what is Christianity really about? <laughs> like, what, what was Jesus Christ teaching? Like, what did Jesus want us actually to do? Putting all our attention on his death and no attention on what he actually taught. I'm on page 54 now, at the top. Every individual lives and must live in the kingdom of God. In this disposition, we have the reconciliation of every individual. Thereby, each becomes a citizen of this kingdom and participates in the enjoyment of this certainty. But this reconciliation is allied to the fact that in Christ, the unity of the divine and human nature is shown forth that it is to say, the way in which the Spirit of God must be present in man. This Christ thus cannot be one who is past and gone, and the life of reconciliation cannot be a mere recollection of that past. For as the just behold Christ in heaven, so must Christ be an object on earth, which may likewise be beheld. In that case, this process must be present, the individual must be united to this, to them, to him, objective form, and it becomes identical with him, the history of Christ, that God reveals himself as man, sacrifice himself, and through this sacrifice raises himself to the right hand of God, is in the individual always being accomplished in the culminating point which is called the sacrifice of the mass. Okay, the mediating element to which the individual relates himself in worship is ever present in the mass as an objective of which the individual must be made to partake as the host and the act of partaking of the same. This host, on the one hand, as objective, is held to be divine, and on the other, it is in form an unspiritual and external thing. And I put in my notes, the suffering of someone to reach divinity. Okay, that's, that's what we focus on. The suffering of someone to reach divine. They, you know, that's, this is all that we focus on, but there's, there's more to it than that. You know, that's 
that kind of focus is archaic and we have to like not move past it because it is a thing that happened right as a christian i do believe that jesus christ sacrificed himself to uh, save humanity but there's more to it than that right there's a lot more to it than that that's not the only important thing and we need to mature and develop and like okay what did jesus christ actually say <laughs> right what did he want us to do okay uh, just to focus only on the sacrifice the violence of his death um, that's obsolete an obsolete interpretation of christianity in my view but let me continue in the, in the text but that is the lowest depth of externa externality reached in the church for in this perfect externality it is before the thing that the knee must be bowed and not in as far as it is an object that may be partaken of and i skip down a few lines the host is honored even as an external thing i skip down some more lines so that the host still held to be a merely external thing must nevertheless be thus high and absolute okay my notes the host is the exploiter the causer of others suffering to manifest divinity you know it's we've used this as an excuse we've uh, used this as a justification oh i'm actually spreading goodness you know i'm actually making the world more ethical more moral by when i make people suffer you know they have to suffer you know you, you have to develop this is how spiritual development works but it's all a guise it's all a ruse right uh we're not doing the hard work of actually sitting down <laughs> and thinking critically about what we're doing thinking critical critically about who god really is what god really wants from us and why god did what god did it's a necessary theological work as a Christian. I am now on page 61, and this is the last paragraph of that page. He speaks as follows of the relation of faith to thought. And here he's referring to, Hegel is referring to um, Anselm, like the famous uh, philosopher of religion. So Anselm says, our faith must be defended by reason against the godless and not against those who glory in the name of Christian. For of those who we may rightly demand that they should hold firm to the obligations which they came under in baptism. Those others must be shown through reason how irrationally they strive against us. The Christian must go on through faith to reason and not come from reason to faith. But if he cannot attain to comprehension, he must still less depart from faith. For if he is able to press on to knowledge, he rejoices therein. When he is unable so to do, he humbly adores. He, you know, now it's Hegel talking, uh, he referring to Anselm, makes a noteworthy remark which contains his whole philosophy in his work, Cur Deus Homo. Okay, which is rich in speculative thought. And now he quotes Anselm again. It appears to me great ne negligence if we are firm in the faith and do not seek also to comprehend what we believe. Okay, <laughs> you know, let's use some thought. Let's try to comprehend our faith. I walk by faith alone, not by sight. Uh, you know, famous quote in the Bible. Okay, you know, but you know, it, Let's use our brain, right? <laughs> saying that we're not re reliant on sight is not saying we're not reliant on our mind. <laughs> you know? Uh, you know, comprehension of our faith is very important, not just blind acceptance. I put in my notes, there must be a, re a wisdom based rationale that is the foundation of faith. Let me continue with the quote. Now this is declared to be arrogance, immediate knowledge, Faith is held to be higher than knowledge, but Anselm and the scholastics maintain the opposite view. For the thought of proving through a simple chain of, of reasoning what was believed, that God exists, left him no rest day and night, and tortured him for long. As first he believed his desire to prove the divine truths through reason to be a temptation of the devil, 
and he was in great anxiety and distress on that account. Finally, however, success came to him by the grace of God in his proslogium. So, you know, using wisdom-based rationality and logic to justify faith is not wrong. <laughs> you know, uh, it is often told to us that it's wrong. You know, Christians are told like, oh, you know, you're supposed to just blindly accept what's in the Bible and what I tell you, <laughs> right? What you, you know, don't try and think about it too much. You, you don't want to enter the mind of God. That's blasphemy. But no, God gave us wisdom. God gave us a mind, okay? We're supposed to use these things. That's part of our duty as Christians. This is what God wants us to do. There is a difference between wisdom and intelligence. Intelligence is just like memorizing the Bible and just recalling the verses just blindly. You know, wisdom is like, okay, what do these verses actually mean? <laughs> you, know, what, you know, what is the context of these verses? When Jesus gave his Sermon on the Mount, what was this sermon actually about? What did he actually mean? What did he actually teach us? What does Jesus actually want us to do? I just highlighted this quick little quote on page 67. <laughs> Never have Catholics been such barbarians as to say that there should not be knowledge of the eternal truth and that it should not be philosophically comprehended. <laughs> Actually, that's not true, right? <laughs> you know, a lot of religious people say philosophy is bad, right? And it's not just Catholics, it's Protestants, it's all types of religious affiliations and denominations. They talk about, don't delve too deeply in the mind of God. You know, some things you're just not gonna understand. It's true, right? You know, when you talk about God, you're talking about infinite wisdom, omnipotence. So there's only so far that we can go. However, I would argue we have not even scratched the surface of how far we can go into our understanding of the teachings of Jesus Christ specifically. Because we're just too busy obsessing over the violent way he died on the cross. Which, again, not saying that was not important. It was very important. But there's a lot more to it than that. And I would say this unhealthy obsession of that has led us to worship as a society violence in general. And in this way, we have glorified violence as a way to reach some sort of divinity or some sort of relationship with God through violence, right? Through extreme torture and trauma. Or rather, we need to take a step back and, be, and actually read what the, Jesus said, <laughs> like his actual words and, and think about, okay, what was he trying to teach us? I mean, he was called the Messiah, right? Which is Hebrew for teacher. Right? What was he trying to teach? Okay, so here we are on page 95. And this is the middle of the page. In a super sensuous world, there was no reality of the thinking, universal, rational, self-consciousness to be met with. In the immediate world of sensuous nature, on the other hand, there was no divinity because nature was but the grave of God in the same way that God was outside of nature. Okay, this idea of nature separate from God, independent of God, right? You know, Jesus saying, my kingdom is not of this world. Mm -hmm. But let me continue. The existence of the church as the government of Christ upon earth is higher, it is true, than the external existence which stands in contrast to it. For religion must rule our temporal affairs, and through the subje subjection of worldly power, the church became a the theocracy. But the divine kingdom, the dwelling place of the dead, was to be reached only through the gate of death. Mm -hmm. That obsession with violence again. <laughs> Yet the natural world was dead to an equal degree. All that lived in it was the vision of that other world and hope it had no present. This idea like, okay, through death and suffering, you can become one with God, right? You can reach the divine, right? So you should separate yourself from nature. And we see this, right, in the world today. We see an exploitation of nature, right, of the environment. The modern example of this in its extreme form is climate change, right, uh, global warming. 
we have exploited the environment in such a way we're destroying it right and the justification is oh well you know we're not you know we're we're different from the environment you know the environment is there for us we exploit the world we we make the world suffer uh, to make it better to achieve a kind of divinity right and so we you know this interpretation of christianity has led us astray uh, you know, when Jesus was saying back to that quote, I am, my kingdom is not of this world. He wasn't saying like, oh, I'm going to completely separate myself from nature. No, right? That, that, I mean, he was made man and interacted with humans and with nature. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jesus did fast in the desert for a number of days, right? So it's not about separating ourselves from nature. It's not about exploiting nature, right? Or making nature suffer so we could achieve some sort of form of divine divinity. It's uh, it's understanding our relationship with nature. That that separation between nature and us is only constructed through a lack of education. Again, like we need to be educated, and the idea that we do need to develop develop beyond our natural selves. Meaning, we need to educate ourselves and understand our relationship with nature. Not just being content with how we are originally, and by growing and developing, we learn more about ourselves, right? And you know, it's a cycle too, because as we learn more about ourselves, we become better, we form a better relationship with nature and with God. And in that way, we learn more about ourselves. In that way, we develop a, a better relationship with ourselves and God, and it's a cycle. Let me skip down four lines. What purpose does all this serve? It lies behind us as a thing of the past and must continue useless to us on its own merits. So we don't forsake nature, right, and leave it to the past, like, oh, I transcended nature. No. And what, you tra what you're transcending is your uneducated self. Your natural tendency to say, oh, I didn't know. I, I don't know what I'm doing, right? I don't know the difference between good and evil. Oh, I didn't know that was, that was wrong what I did. Uh, but you can know if you put the work in and the effort into it. Okay, now I'm on page 96 and I begin on the uh, uh, second paragraph. If we seek an immediate contrast to scholastic philosophy and theology and their methods, we may say that it is to be found in the healthy human understanding, in outward and inward experience, in the contemplation of nature and in humanity. And that's what I'm talking about, that, that cycle of contemplating your relationship between nature, which reinforces your understanding of humanity in general and who you are as a human person, as a self, as a being, and ultimately how that all relates back to God. So now I'm on page 104, beginning on the sixth line, I think. <laughs> Bear with me, I'm not sure if that's exactly right because I'm, I printed these pages on the printing paper. But about around there, Christians made the mistake of thinking that they would find satisfaction in this. And this was the true object of their search. But they did not understand themselves. These holy spots, the Mount of Olives, the Jordan, Nazareth, as external sensuous presence of place without presence of time, are things of the past, a mere memory, no perception of the immediate present. Christians found only their loss, their grave, in, the, in this present. Okay, now put in my notes. The misinterpretation of Christianity prevents beneficial application in the present. Okay, we, these stories of the past have, we've interpreted them in this way. You know, I'm talking about the institution of Christianity, how popular Christianity is taught today through, you know, this glorification of violence, or, honestly, to be honest, and not focusing on like the philosophy that's taught in, Christi in Christian doctrine, particularly what Jesus taught. Uh, we don't, you know, Christians don't know how to apply like what Jesus said in today's world, <laughs> you know, we don't, we uh, take, Christians take really old stories that apply 
to specific historical contexts, particularly in the Old Testament, and they apply them, you know, these past laws that are no longer applicable today, and they try to apply them to today's world, and it just doesn't work. <laughs> you know, you know, we're Christians are at a loss of how to apply their doctrine to today's society, right? and we need to work on that. Right? And I think it begins by stop having this huge obsession over like the violence that's in Christianity, right? And like seeing that violence as some sort of gateway into God's kingdom. I'm not trying to dismiss, you know, the violence as not important. Okay, you know, you know, traumatic experiences, they are prevalent in the Bible and they do, uh, they did have significance and impacts that are necessary to learn about. You know, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is a significant sacrifice that does mean a lot. And I say it doesn't mean a lot, right? it does. But don't forget all the other things Jesus did too, which many Christians can't really recall. You know, you talk about, okay, what did Jesus do while he was alive? I don't know, he just died on the cross, that's it, that's all I know. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, he also walked on water and I guess turned bread into water. I don't, I don't, you know, it's like, do you recall anything he actually taught? Like any of the lessons that he actually said? <laughs> so that's what I'm saying, that's all I'm saying. But let me continue. So I'm gonna read the last sentence from that paragraph. What pertains to the world has thus become fixed in itself. That is, it has received into itself thought, justice, reason. Okay. From an historic point of view, it may be remarked that as on the one side, we see the selflessness of spirit, the fact that spirit is not at home with itself, the torn and rent condition of man, on the other side, we see the political condition becoming more consolidated in the establishment of an independence which is no longer merely selfish. And I skip down five lines. Justice, however, has its root in freedom, and thus the individual therein brings himself into existence, and it is recognized, nevertheless, relationships which properly belong to the state are here still made the concern of private individuals. Okay, what does that mean? I put in my notes, justice represented as creation of capital to obtain independence through exploitative suffering. Okay, this is how justice is interpreted today. Right, you know, justice today is punitive, is based in punishment. Right, you did something wrong, you have to be punished. And then that will right the wrong. That's how the wrong, the wrong is righted, you know. And it just harkens all the way back to this idea of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But it goes further back than that, right? It's this, you know, it's this. Again, it's this confrontation that human beings act, realize, like, wow, you su we suffer a lot. What is the meaning of all this suffering, you know? And and that culminated into the stories of our most cherished religions, Christianity, this idea where God was like, well, these people that my creation, these people are sinners. So for them to be saved, I have to, there needs to be some sort of like punishment has to occur. That's the only way, right? This divine law, right? Like someone has to suffer for their wrongdoings. Somebody's got to do it. Who's going to be? I guess I got to do my son. You know, in this way, you know, I think it's a, the way looking at that is a, is a limiting of God, where God has to follow a certain uh, divine law. Like, oh, to save these, my creation, I have to uh, offer a kind of suffering to of an innocent person. Right? That's, just, that's just how it's going to be. Well, well, but if God was all-powerful which Christians believe in then that wouldn't have to be the case right that wouldn't be necessary it'd be like you know I could do whatever I want like if they're saved they're saved and it also kind of goes against the idea that God is love which is another thing that Christians believe in right God is love where God loves you infinitely uh, well if God loves you infinitely why does he should be able to just love you and not have to use some bargaining chip or some sort of like 
the suffering of an innocent person. You, you, God should just be able to be like, hey, look, I love you, whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, so in, in, my, in my view, it's kind of a, a you know, it's, it's a limiting of God. Or, you know, it's, it's a, uh, you know, when you look at God as a, uh, a being of, of ultimate love, of radical love, of this is what love is, is that really necessary? Rather, rather the way I see it is God was like, okay, I'm gonna have to teach my creation, my, the people that I created, how to actually deal with reality. I have to teach them this. So uh, I'm gonna, the way I'm gonna do it is I'm gonna send my son into the world to get them lessons so that they can learn how to deal with the, the reality of the world of the reality of existence. Now I know that by doing that he's they're gonna there's some people in the world that are going to torture him to death. Like I understand that this is gonna have to happen this ha this is gonna happen. But I'm gonna do it anyway because I want these my creation to learn because I love them. So in this way it's less of him, God following some sort of divine judge balance or like some sort of scale like that's limiting God, rather it's like, look, I know they're going to kill my son, or and then you know Jesus himself saying, look, I know I'm going to be tortured to death, but I don't care, you know. I love these people, so I'm going to teach them, you know. Consequences be damned. And when you look at it like that, to me, it's like, oh wow, I need to really pay attention to what this, this what he said, <laughs> like what did you know, because he knew. This was going to happen to him, so this must be really important, <laughs> right? So, for me, it's more like, okay, what is this philosophy that Jesus taught? That must, that's front and center. That's very important for me, uh, because you know, and that's not, and in this way, you're, I'm not diminishing the sacrifice that was made. Like, I'm not doing that. Uh, it was a, a sacrifice, um, and it was very important. It, it just shows, you know, his courage, his love, his. Uh, unlimited kindness and compassion, but it's not to worship or glorify or, uh, you know, put the violence front and center. Like, listen, this amazing, you know, the torture that he went through, like, you know, that's a consequence of the more important thing, which, which is his teaching. <laughs> that is the most important part. Okay, now I'm on page 153. This is the last paragraph. The spirit is, however, in the second place, really thinking spirit likewise. Thought as such must also develop itself therein, and that really as this form of inmost unity of spirit with itself. Thought must come to the distinction and contemplation of this content and pass over into this form of the purest unity of spirit with itself. At first, thought, however, reveals itself as abstract thought alone and it possesses as such a relation to theology and religion. The content which is here in question, even so far as it is historic, merely and externally accepted, must yet be religious. The unfolding of the nature of God must be present therein. In this we have the further demand that the thought for which the inward nature of God is should also set itself in relation to this content. But inasmuch as thought is at first understanding and the metaphysic of the understanding, it will remove from the content the rational idea and make it so empty that only external history remains, which is devoid of interest. What is all that? <laughs> really, it's the merging of the mind and the spirit. And what's that? That's free will. <laughs> That's the understanding of good versus evil, distinguishing between the two. What's another word for that? Philosophy, you know, specifically ethics, which is, you know, the moral, moral philosophy, that branch. But let me skip down uh, nine lines here. We're still on page 154. All the enrichment of the content whereby it became philosophic is thus abandoned. And what follows later simply is that the mind as thinking again immerses itself in itself in order to be concrete and rational. The abstract moment of a mind being within self, of freedom, of coming to self, 
Freedom signifies the life of the spirit in being turned back within itself in the particular content which appears as another. While the spirit is not free if it allows this other being either unassimilated or dead to exist in it as something foreign. In as far as spirit now goes on to knowledge, to spiritual determinations, and as it looks around and comes forth as a content, so far will it co conduct itself therein as in its own domain, as in its concrete world, so to speak, and it will there really assert and possess its own. Okay, I put in my notes. Uh, the spirit is not free until it works in conjunction with wisdom. Wisdom is necessary for spiritual growth. We have to study the word of God as Christians. So we have to study it, and we, we don't, and not study it blindly. <laughs> like not just accept words from other people. Like think, use your own wisdom, use your own mind, and think it through in your own head. You know, this is how you spiritually develop. This is what God wants. Okay, and I also put in my notes here, wisdom is different than knowledge. For knowledge can trap the spirit while wisdom frees the spirit. Because knowledge is just like what everybody else says about Christianity or what everybody else says about the Bible. But what do you think <laughs> is said in the Bible? What is, and what's required of that? That means you actually have to read what's being said uh, you actually have to uh, think it through yourself, by yourself, you know, and also after you think it through yourself, consult others, right? That's important too. They're in relationship with other people. Uh, talk it out, critically think about it. Uh, and that's wisdom as opposed to just knowledge. Knowledge is awareness of reality, okay? You're aware of reality. Wisdom is applying that awareness constructively in a progressive way. That's wisdom. Such application is what frees the spirit. Okay? That kind of ability, that is a positive application of free will. You know, using your knowledge of what's good and what's evil to develop spiritually. And where does this knowledge come from? As a Christian, I say it comes from the teachings of Jesus Christ. So let me read you this quote. It's from page 169. It starts three lines down. A philosopher, it is said, should live as a philosopher, i.e. should be independent of the external relationships of the world and should give up occupying himself with and troubling himself concerning them. But thus circumscribed in respect of all necessities, more especially of culture, no one can suffice for himself. He must seek to act in connection with others. The modern world is this essential power of connection and it implies the fact that it is clearly necessary for the individual to enter into these relations of external existence. Only a common mode of existence is possible in any calling or condition. So well, it's not enough to just learn on your own, right? I'm saying like it is important to do that, right? to like read for yourself uh, critically think about it in your own mind but don't just stop there you know interact with other people interact with people who share your beliefs interact with people who do not share your beliefs and implement your knowledge uh, in the world with others this is a kind of moral ethical ecology right where you're putting your morals or your wisdom into practice by interacting with people and understanding how what you critically think, how your philosophy uh, relates to other people, to other selves. Thus, in early times, bravery was individual, while modern bravery consists in each not acting after his own fashion, but relying on his connection with others. And this constitutes his whole merit. Okay? That's bravery today. <laughs> Interacting with others. Okay? Not saying, you know, forget everybody else. You know, or, or like, you know what? Those people are going to suffer. I'm doing just fine. <laughs> okay? No, no, that's not, that's not what Jesus did, right? Right? And um, that's not what he taught. You share your knowledge. Share your wisdom with others. 
Uh, you talk it through, you critically think, and then you develop yourself while other people develop with you. And this is partly what this YouTube channel is about, is me developing my understanding of Christianity, right? And develop, developing my understanding of ethics by talking to people and expressing my opinion and my views and my wisdom with others and then learning from my uh, misunderstandings, misinterpretations, and other people's misunderstandings and misinterpretations and seeing what I, how I say relates to others. And the internet's a great way to do that. And that's where Hegel, even though, you know, Hegel lived long before the internet, but it's true, modern bravery consists in relying on the connection of others. You know, and you just think about today, how that's so uh, applicable. So anyway, that's what I wanted to focus on in this video, <laughs> is this obsession that we have with violence in terms of like Christianity and violence being this gateway to God. Violence is a, is a fact, it's a consequence of life, right? It's a thing that happens. But what's most important, right? What's most important is the philosophical teachings of the Bible. Particularly if you're a Christian, I'm talking about the philosophical teachings of Jesus Christ, right? That's very important. Do we even pay attention to that as Christians today? Not really, <laughs> you know, not really. All we care about, you know, the Christian institution, we just obsess over the death of Jesus Christ and how torturous it was. And through that, we're saved, which, you know, I'm not saying that's not important. You know, by faith alone, we are saved. That's the insight of Martin Luther. Uh, and I'm a Luther myself, got it, not important, not saying that. Uh, his sacrifice was insignificant. It was very significant. As a Christian, I believe that. And as a Christian, I do believe Jesus is my savior. But I also believe that he had some very important things to say on the earth. He had some very important lessons that he taught that uh, most, the vast majority of Christians today do not even care about, <laughs> which is you know, a travesty because, you know, he died so that these lessons could be taught. And we just... And Christianity as, a, as an institution just pushes it aside. Say, oh, that doesn't matter. You know, just live your life the way you want to. As long as you acknowledge that he's died for your sins, you're good. <laughs> it's like, that is not what, that, that is not the message of Jesus Christ. Well, you have been watching The Black Ponderer. Tune in next time for more Philosophical Thought.